Hello, can you all hear me? Can you all see? Is that Finton at the back? Yes, good. What is cloud native and why should I care? I apologize if you've seen this before and you may see a slightly different version of it on Thursday. So what I wanted to do today was make the session just a little bit more interactive. And Diane, if you think I need to slow down on, and focus on just one bit, just, just please let me know to do that. Um, my job is the, I'm the CEO of Weaveworks company that I hope you've heard of. Please try our product, Weave Cloud. It works with OpenShift. I also am the TOC chairperson for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is an interesting job right now because it's a new foundation doing very, very exciting and amazing things. It's building a toolkit for the next generation of applications, or Cloud Native apps as we like to call them. Talk a bit about what that means today. Projects like Kubernetes, Prometheus, gRPC are part of this foundation, which is why it's so important. These are the tools that you should use if you want to do cloud native. So just a few standard bits about it, just so that we, we all know what we're talking about, the same thing. It's a nonprofit organization. It's part of the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation today is a much bigger beast than when it was founded. It was originally set up to look after Linux, an important thing to do. So important that now Microsoft has joined the Linux Foundation, I think, not too many months ago. It's organized into different sub-foundations, each of which focuses on a particular area of functionality. There's another one for blockchain, for example. This one's all about bringing together the tool set for cloud native and promoting it, and educating people about how to use it, and helping customers and users in that area, and developers. As of today, we have seven projects in the Cloud Native Foundation. Um, here they are. You might recognize some of these. Who here has heard of Kubernetes? Who here has not heard of Kubernetes? There you go. Thank you. Um, you may not know all of the projects. FluentD is a logging system uh, for log, log forwarding. CoreDNS was originally SkyDNS. It's a refactoring to work in a number of broader use cases, and it's a standalone modern DNS server. The author wrote 8888, so he knows what he's doing. Um, gRPC is the replacement transport for things like REST and JSON when you're doing high-performance cloud-native style you know, scalable architectures originally developed at Google. Linkerd is an iteration from Finagle, originally developed at Twitter. It's a tool for more RPC in the case where you need to have a web-facing proxy, and you need to scale that. As you know, Twitter have all kinds of scalability issues, uh, little Tweety birds holding up whales and things like that. So Linkerd was born out of that need. Open Tracing is a toolkit for building tracing libraries in a standard manner because people believe, or we believe in the TOC, that you will want to trace everything pretty soon. So we need a way of helping you to do that. And Prometheus, born in Berlin, three cheers for Prometheus. Who, who has not heard of Prometheus? Good. It's a monitoring, alerting, and analytics tool. And there are sponsor members, companies that you've probably heard of. I don't know why Weaveworks is not on here, but it should be. Um, so uh, let's just go on. OK. And it's important to see Cloud Native as part of a longer progression of series of changes in computing. Um, going right back to um, when I first got involved in the industry around the year 2000, when it was all about you know, hardware and selling tin and salespeople selling tin. And now we've gone through all these different iterations of technology. Who, who remembers when Heroku appeared in 2000 and I think it was eight? Okay, they invented a bunch of the stuff that people take for granted today. But the original problem Heroku was trying to solve was Ruby's really great to develop with, but it's a nightmare operationally, and I'm trying to use the cloud, so how do I do that? And they realized that you could automate a bunch of things and give developers a developer-friendly API for operations. And there began this new era of cloud native from Heroku. There's other, other sources, too, that I'll mention. You know, OpenStack is a thing. Um, OpenShift is a thing, apparently. What is OpenShift, Diane? Yeah. I don't know. Anyone know? Who? OpenShift and actually Cloud Foundry are the sort of iterations from Heroku, showing you the evolutionary path here. Not identical, but they've gone in slightly different directions. 
And then you have containers where you have a company, Docker, or DocCloud as it was called, that said, we want to make a PaaS too. Now you may be wondering why would somebody make another PaaS when you've got Heroku and OpenShift and Cloud Foundry, but in those days it just wasn't obvious which model was correct. And they found they couldn't make that work as a business. But along the side, they'd taken LXC, the container model from Linux, which had become really good by then, and made it into something that they could use for their daily 24-7 deployments of .cloud as DevOps people. And thought, wow, what if we just use this? And maybe other people would like to use it. And they decided to talk about it at a conference, and then suddenly everyone went crazy. And here we all are. And then Cloud Native, the foundation, and Kubernetes, and many of the other projects. Now, the projects I've spoken about should also work with OpenShift and containers. It's not directly tied only to Kubernetes. So in summary, the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is open source cloud computing for applications, Cloud Native applications, which we believe are what businesses, startups, developers, enterprises, want to build in the future in the same way that people in the 1990s got excited about building websites. The key difference, of course, is these are not just static HTML pages. These are richly interactive ways of dealing with potentially multi-million global customer base. And it matters to businesses because they, need, they know they need to build these in order to stay ahead of the market. And I'll talk a bit about that. And in the CNCF, we are curating and promoting a trusted toolkit for these applications and architectures. So I mentioned Heroku. Another key antecedent is Netflix. Netflix decided they were going to deliver DVDs by post originally, I believe. And at some point they thought, hmm, this Amazon 1999 business model isn't working out too well. We're not very different from a blockbuster at the end of the day. And people always forget to send their DVDs back. And somebody said, well, could we deliver it over the web and get rid of the lap postage and waiting for things to come back and the plastic CDs and everything else? And they tried it on the web by then just about was good enough to do this. And they thought, okay, we can send a movie or a TV show over the internet to some people. What if we wanted to do this anywhere in the world at any time and make sure that people could have pretty much guarantee that when they click the button play, the film will actually show and they will be entertained? not flickery or you need to install some more software or it pauses, there's a little wibbly pie chart and things like that. So they wrote the technology team that was tasked with meeting this obvious and simple business requirement, um, <laughs> wrote down these criteria, um, which they subsequently talked about. These slides are actually from a much later Amazon Web Services reInvent conference. And there's a link there. I recommend you look at them. There's many slides from Netflix on the subject. Um, but the requirements were web scale, global, highly available, consumer facing, and they called it, ha, just for short, let's call it cloud native. And uh, cloud native for Netflix was a very practical and important business consideration. Their customers had this kind of what, what the CEO calls the moment of truth, which basically is a kind of Harvard business person's way of saying, a family sits down on the sofa, and are they gonna read a fulfilling educational book or talk to each other and you know, build a relationship among themselves, or are they gonna turn on the TV? And of course, Netflix wanna win that war. They want you to turn on the TV because it's instantly pleasing. And so to do that, they had to move what they called the curve, which was a um, ratio of uh, rate of change of, to the system and availability to end users. <coughs> Now, these are you know, non-functional properties of an environment that are very important. For Netflix, they were business critical. Below a certain level of availability, they couldn't meet that promise to customers. People would not flick on Netflix if they thought it would be unavailable even 1% of the time or 1,000th of the time. At the same time, the Netflix team realized that in order to give customers what they wanted, they were gonna have to make a lot of changes to the system very, very frequently, because they didn't really know exactly what customers wanted when they started. They figured that the easier thing to do would be to give them something and listen to what they had to say and then change it very, very quickly. Now, this might sound blindingly obvious to you now in 2017, but when they did this in 2009, it was not obvious at all. They were among just a few companies, companies like Facebook and Google and others as well, who really had adopted this idea that you might make several hundred changes a day to your systems in order to make people happy. 
Whereas previously, people had made, been making changes to their web websites once every six months after a lot of meetings. And so they wanted to do both of these things at once, which is a really difficult thing to do. Do you read these slides? And then this worked. And suddenly, everybody wanted to be like this. They wanted to have these rich, instant customer experiences on any device, anywhere in the world. And suddenly, you have people like this man, who you may have seen do. I hope you know who this person is. He's a fat American capitalist who invests in startups, Mark Andreessen. Uh, he also founded Net Netscape long ago and has been a sort of entrepreneurial hero of Silicon Valley. Um, but he kind of represents this idea that he, quote, he coined this phrase, software is eating the world, which could only be said after not only Netflix, but many other companies had appeared in different areas, not only films, but also taxis, hotels, travel, etc where suddenly there were new web-powered businesses that also worked on your phone, and consumers got really excited about it because they were so easy to use, and they always did that because they could be on anywhere, and they could be iter iterated on very quickly. And then, of course, people thought, well, we can be on Netflix too. And, and the answer is, you know, we may laugh because, you know, we, we all want to be the unicorn, but uh, many of us will end up dreaming in the fields, like this fellow on the left. But the reality is, that companies that do not create online experiences for their customers, just in traditional businesses, will struggle to keep up today with, with companies that do. Unless you're in kind of artisanal bread making or hand painted coffee mugs or something like that, or you know, wax moustaches, or any of the things that happen in my area of Shoreditch in London, um, you, know, you really are having to deal with the largest number of customers, which means interacting over the web, in a certain way. So you've got to take this stuff seriously. And you can actually measure it. Um, this chart is from a report a couple of years ago, Puppet Lab State of DevOps, a, a report I highly recommend reading every year when it comes out, showing you the difference for key metrics between what they call high and low performers, which are defined to be people in a certain percentile of the normal distribution. And uh, here's an example. Mean time to recovery in 2015 top performers were 168 times faster than low performers. So think about what that means for availability. That's the difference between seconds and minutes and minutes and hours. It's huge. And it grew between 2014 and 2015. You may not be able to read at the back, but on the right it says 48 times in 2014. It went up to 168 times in 2015. So it's getting worse, not better, for the majority of, of people. So there's this need for speed, and it's measurable and it's relating to these technologies. So what is it about cloud native that helps me go fast? So we decided to conduct an experiment on our own company, which is the correct place to conduct experiments if you're a startup, um, and build our product in this way. So our product, I mentioned, we're simplifying develop delivery for cloud native apps with a number of features like monitoring and continuous deployment. And here's an old picture of our architecture. And you, know, you don't need to read all the details. The point is, it's somewhat complex because it's providing multiple different services to end users through a web screen. There's core services, there's visualization, data storage, and monitoring, and management of the, of the thing itself. And it's not a 12-factor app. Who here knows what a 12-factor app is? Most of you. Great. So often people talk about 12-factor apps being cloud-native. 12-factor is an abstraction of the ideas pioneered by Heroku and followed up on by Cloud Foundry and OpenShift. It's essentially taking the best way to build web apps in a 24-7 DevOps environment and incarnating them in practices and in software. But this is more complicated than that kind of application. So the question becomes, how do you enable all of the world's applications to be up all the time and available anywhere and all these things? And it, this is meaningful, you can measure this. I mean, if you look at the adoption of Amazon, it's been wildly successful on some super growth, you know, double hockey stick chart. And something like Heroku has also been very successful, but, but much more slowly than Amazon. Which shows you that these 12 factor, factor apps, up until now, have had a somewhat limited appeal relative to the broader use of the cloud. So cloud native, in parts, aims to broaden the appeal of these more uh, functional frameworks to a larger class of applications. And this is kind of a recapitulation of the Netflix needs, but it's worth mentioning. At WeaveWorks, we have the same kinds of needs. We want to be up all the time. 
Uh, we don't want to write infrastructure. We want our app developers to do app development and not become experts in you know, reliable storage. Uh, we also have a business that has multiple parts and they're not all used at the same amount by, by the same people at the same time. So we needed to scale components independently. Now the equivalent over Netflix would be, you know, some movies are more popular than others. So you need to be able to keep your costs down in parts of your system that are not being used and be able to scale up in parts of your system that are being used. That can only happen if they move independently. We didn't want to spend lots of money integrating infrastructure either. So we use Kubernetes and Prometheus to power our app. In fact, we've been running Ku Kubernetes in production on Amazon for nearly two years now on multiple zones. It's pretty cool. Um, but we didn't want to do all the work that we, we wanted to kind of come out of the open source community there. We do also contribute. And finally, we wanted to be open source, not Amazon source. Now, we, we love Amazon. We absolutely give them tons of money. And we're very happy to run on Amazon. But, but we, we don't want to feel like we're stuck there. We want to know that if we have customers who need to be on Google Cloud or need to be on IBM Bluemix or need to be on their own machines, that we can do that. Which means that not only must the infrastructure be portable, but all the services around it have to be portable too. And they're just not today. There are bits missing. So where are those portable multi-cloud open services going to come from? Answer, somebody's got to bring them together. So to summarize our technical needs, they're basically automation, which leads you down the path of orchestration today, orchestrating containers and scheduling them to make apps, and CICD, which is the automation of deployment. Abstracting the infrastructure from the app by standard packaging. Hence, containers turn out to be a solution to that problem. And cloud native patterns, different patterns for different parts of the app. How do you monitor? How do you log? How do you stay available? How do you do alerts? How do you fix things when they go wrong? What is a microservice anyway? That kind of stuff. A whole collection of these things. And so this was really the distillation of our technical needs. And it turns out these are exactly the things the Cloud Native Foundation aims to bring together too. So I say that Cloud Native, you can be described as a set of patterns for using containers, automation, and microservices. This is Adrian Cockroft who's spoken an awful lot about this stuff. I highly recommend you check out his presentations. He's now employed by Amazon, of course. So, okay, if Cloud Native is these patterns, then we need open source tools to be able to implement them. We need to know how to use them. They need to come from somewhere. Somebody needs to look after them. They need to move at the pace of modern software, and they mustn't lock us in. So, going back to the list I showed you at the beginning, here are some of these tools. We now have seven tools in, in, in uh, CNCF. I've described them already, but I'll just run through them for the people at the back. Kubernetes for container orchestration. Prometheus for monitoring and analysis. FluentD for log forwarding. Open tracing for interoperable tracing. Linkerd for traffic management and proxies. And I wrote, oh, it's a slightly old slide. GRPC and CoreDNS are now in the CNCF, which are respectively a transport and a DNS server. And there's, there's more to come. In fact, there may be more to come this week. Fingers crossed. So it's a layered stack in the CNCF. We're focused on the top few layers, the runtime orchestration app, de app de development. We don't build clouds. So that's OpenStack's job. We're very interested in automated pipelines. So not only having opinions about what tools to use, and how to layer them, but also how to deploy them. Here's an example that, that we use at Weaveworks. It's what I call the ABCD of automation. Develop using your favorite framework. Build using your favorite CI system. Make some containers, put them in an image repo. There's uh, Rocket and uh, Docker Container D on the right. And uh, deploy them using a deployment tool and run them on your favorite execution environment. I, I made a mistake of putting Kubernetes here, but I, of course, should have had OpenShift in there as well. Okay, just to pause, has anyone got, anyone got any questions, violent objections, desire that I talk less, or anything like that? Okay. And um, where does OpenShift fit in? I described OpenShift earlier as a PaaS. I know that it now is also enterprise Kubernetes, I believe, so it's a bit broader than that. Um, there's two kinds of PaaS, a platform as a service. Something where you structured everything into one big black box, which is really Heroku to run where you like. And that's kind of the Cloud Foundry model. 
and pluggable pads, which I think OpenShift is striving to get closer to, where you get some out-of-the-box functionality, but there's more elements of pluggability and build it yourself. You probably won't be able to read this picture, I apologize, but it is available on GitHub. Uh, this is what we call the cloud native landscape. And the point about this picture is to show you the potential scope and importance and scale of this space. So I mentioned we have a layering. This is mapped onto here with infrastructure, provisioning, runtime, orchestration and management, and app definition and development at the top. And the app dev space is, is richly, it's full, of, it's full of wonderful things. It's a core new copia of software covering all possible things you can think of, languages and frameworks, databases, streaming, source code management, app dev, registry services, CI, CD, and API servers. And the CNCF doesn't aspire to provide you with all of those things, but they are there to show you what could be run on top of the right stack. We are very focused on the middle layers. Orchestration and management and the runtime, maybe a bit of the provisioning, and then also how you monitor and manage all this stuff. We've got platforms for management, observability and analytics on the right. And the tools that I mentioned are all shown here somewhere. And this also maps out some of the things that we might want to see in the foundation in the future. So I've mentioned the word foundation a lot. Why do we need a foundation? What is it? Is it a benevolent technocracy? Is it like Star Trek? Is it some kind of karmic Buddhist thing? What it's really about is everybody working together. Yes, and dancing together. Here's the Linux Foundation. It's safeguard Linux for the long term. This is really good for customers because they understand the brand. They know it's open source. It's a way to collaborate in a trusted manner, as we discussed in the panel this morning. And it brings them together under one umbrella to do that. So. Last few points coming up. This gives you a way to have common open source, not single vendor open source, but open source that is truly shared and trusted by everybody from end users to vendors, SIs, consultancies, cloud providers, the lot. And this is important because I mentioned software is eating the world, open source is eating software, and cloud is now eating open source. So we need a defense against that. So the commons provides us a way out of the lock-in puzzle created by the huge growth of cloud and its consumption of everything, which is, of course, terrifying if, like me, you were a small furry animal inside. So what steps are we taking to help deal with that? We curate open source in a way that everybody can use. People like Docker, Google, IBM, eBay, and Goldwyn can all play nicely together. This is amazingly new. And we look for high quality. This is the job of the TOC is to identify high quality projects and the rules that go with those. We don't pick winners, we just pick quality and speed. <coughs> we help end users by providing them with education and events like this one, upstairs tomorrow, and guidance, what does it mean to be cloud native? A badge of trust and interoperability. How can we make sure that Kubernetes does work with Prometheus and FluentD? We can help to do that all under one big brand, trusted commons. And then, of course, we have to help the projects. And if you're a developer who's involved in one of these things, this is incredibly important to us. So we're project first, ultimately. We believe that good projects get good users, make them happy, and that makes the project successful. And that's a virtuous cycle that we want to support. So just to wrap, this is something that happened last, late last year. Samson, Greg Bob Wise, really great bloke, said, I call upon the CNCF to foster a common community container implementation that can be used by Kubernetes, Mesos, and Cloud Foundry, backed by them. It's transparent to, default, to become the default container implementation for a wide number of open source orchestration systems. And he called it an ode to boring. Infrastructure should be boring. And since that time, both Container D from Docker and RKT from CoreOS have been proposed as container implementations, and they're being voted on right now. So who knows, maybe they will be in the CNCF sometime quite soon. So that will be another big step forward for giving you a trusted, safe toolkit for cloud applications. Do we do standards? It's not about standards. It's about giving people tools they can trust. So here's how we see it evolving. Right now, we're still at the stage of 
new projects coming in and getting faster and faster. Kubernetes is one of the most outstandingly su successful projects in the market today. Docker is you know, also amazing. Then we're building a cloud native story around that, which this presentation is part of that process. And finally, we hope that as time goes by, people will see this as a completely standard technology you can use in the same way as websites are now what, a de facto standard for everybody. So to finish up, Cloud Native Foundation is open source cloud computing for applications. And the job of the foundation is to curate and promote a trusted toolkit for modern architectures. Thank you very much.